In this lecture, we'll be talking about Dido as both a mythological and a historical figure. We'll begin by looking at the circumstances of her departure from Phoenicia and then go to her arrival in North Africa and her negotiation for land in order to build a settlement for her people. And then we'll look at Yarbis, a Berber, his marriage proposal and Dido's response to that. And then finally look at Virgil's invented meeting of Dido and Aeneas and the consequences of this for Dido's literary character, that is, her representation in literary texts. So Dido, or Alyssa as she was also known, founded Carthage. She was the legendary founder of this city in North Africa in modern day Tunisia. Carthage was a Phoenician colony, historically and archaeologically seems to have been founded as early as the late 9th century BC. Um, and the archaeological record is a little bit complex, but suggests possibly a date as early as the late century or the late, sorry, excuse me, the late 9th century or the late 8th century. The legendary date of Carthage's foundation is 814 BC, so somewhat before the foundation of Rome, which dated to 753 BC, but not significantly earlier. At the time that Carthage was founded, the Phoenicians were also founding colonies in the Western Mediterranean on Sicily and Sardinia, so it's not a surprise that they went further to the west to North Africa. And they seem to have used these cities as basically places to rest, fuel, refuel the boats um, in terms of getting them restocked, getting the soldiers' um, food put on, on, the colonists' food put on, um, but they also established permanent dwellings, um, permanent settlements in these cities. So they were both way stations, but also places where colonists could go. So the founder of Carthage itself in the historical record, um, which as with Aeneas and Romulus, seems to blend fairly seamlessly with mythology, um, was Alyssa, um, or Dido as she was known. Um, she's from a royal Phoenician family and went into exile after her brother murdered her husband. And on the left hand side you have a representation of Dido um, sticking the sword through her breast. So you can see her holding it um, in what is her right hand. So the story of Dido's escape from Phoenicia. Um, originally she had a brother, Pygmalion, so Alyssa and Pygmalion were siblings. Um, her father died and in fact left both of his children equally his kingdom. Alyssa, or Dido, married a Carabas, a priest of Melkart, um, which was the Phoenician Punic version of Hercules. Pygmalion, thinking that this, this, um, his brother-in-law, a Carabas, possessed a great treasure that he was hiding, had him murdered, um, thinking that this was going to, to get money for him. Um, Dido realizes that she needs to get out of town. But she's very clever, and we're going to see this cleverness or propensity for trickery throughout her story. Um, she feigns a desire to move into her brother's palace. Um, so her husband is dead, she's left alone, she needs protection. The obvious thing to do would be to move into her brother's palace, even though he in fact is the, the murderer of her husband. Um, but in the process, she actually manages to get his palace attendants to join her as exiles in flight. And it's unclear exactly what the political circumstances were that led to Dido slash Alyssa's flight um, from Phoenicia, but it does seem like some, there was some kind of power um, struggle between the two and between their supporters. So in fact, we're told by some historians that some of the Phoenician senators, some of the elite actually left town as well. So it seems like in the aftermath of their father's death, there's a power struggle between Dido and her brother Pygmalion um, for who's going to rule um, that particular kingdom. Um, in fact, Dido decides um, that she's not going to be successful, and so she leaves. And so in ways that are not dissimilar from Aeneas's flight from Troy, 
Dido now flees from Phoenicia. Um, and again, we see her cleverness at play when during her flight, when Pygmalion's um, men are, are pursuing her and the, the exiles, um, she throws bags into the sea to, to throw them off the scent. Um, they're thinking that she's leaving with this hidden treasure that her husband had, this, these bags of gold. Well, what she does is, in fact, throw these bags into the sea. They stop, think that they've got the gold. It turns out the bags are filled with sand, um, and she's able to make a clean getaway. So the first thing that Dido and her fellow exiles do is land on Cyprus, a neighboring island um, that's, that um, has a settlement um, there that, that um, has a, in a temple. Um, they kidnap 80 women that are what are called temple prostitutes. Um, what exactly that meant is not entirely clear to modern scholars. But there is a, is a view that there were um, sort of throughout um, Greece women who basically served as sex slaves in, in temples, um, in religious temples. So the exiles get, land on Cyprus. Basically, they're there probably to um, get supplies. Um, they have a long journey ahead of them. And in the process, they grab some women. Um, so again, similar to... Um, the rape of the Sabine women that Romulus oversees. Here we have um, Dido and the, the men getting wives for themselves um, from Cyprus among these temple prostitutes. Um, when they land in um, North Africa, so a quite distant journey, um, but when they land there, Dido approaches a uh, native king, um, a Berber. Um, these were the, the native inhabitants you can still find um, Berbers in North Africa to this day. Dido approaches this, this Berber king, Yarbis, um, and asks him for just a little bit of land. Um, and in fact, so little that all she wants is as much as an ox hide could encompass. So you can imagine, you know, unless this is a, a giant ox, um, not very much land. But Dido's clever. And we again see her propensity for cleverness at play when she has this ox hide cut into extremely thin strips, so as thin as they will go. And then she lays the strips around a plot of land that's large enough to encompass what is now um, Bursa Hill. Um, so this is a, a pretty um, significant sized hill, which serves as the, the center of um, Carthage, where sort of in its earliest foundations, like the Palatine Hill in Rome, um, Bursa Hill is where Dido's residence would have been her palace and various other kinds of civic buildings and then people, the inhabitants would have lived um, either sort of on the lower reaches of the hill or down in the, in the base of the hill. Um, but the important thing here is seeing how Dido is able to use her clever mind, her wit, um, to actually outsmart Yarbis. And on the left hand slide, side of your slide, um, you have a, an artistic representation of Dido making this negotiation, this trade of land. And you can see sort of down there um, the, the ox hide, the head still attached, um, and not a really big um, hide. So when Yarvis says, sure, I'll give you a plot of land that the ox hide can encompass, he is thinking he's just giving up maybe um, the amount of land that you could plant a tree on, not an entire um, settlement area. Um, and here is a map just um, to orient you. Um, so, so Dido is leaving from the area um, just to the right of the arrow um, where modern day Lebanon, um, Syria is, and Cyprus, just a, a short hop over. This is where they kidnap um, the 80 women that are going to be their wives. And then they continue to sell westward um, to um, Tunis. Um, so Carthage is just north of Tunis, um, modern day Tunis in Tunisia. So you can see that it, essentially she's just sailing almost directly west um, to North Africa. So once Dido has land for a settlement, she begins construction. And we're told that among the settlers in this original um, Carthage were some native Berbers and also some other Phoenician colonists that came down to Carthage from an earlier Phoenician colony in Utica. Um, and as 
we've talked about in a previous lecture, Utica is just north of Carthage, also on the coast, um, was an important site um, for, it's on, it's on the coast, an important trading post. Um, the legend reports that when these settlers are actually digging the foundations for the buildings that they're going to erect um, on Bursa Hill, that they found either the head of an ox or a horse. Um, and so depending on which one they found, the interpretation differs slightly and, it, and it in some important ways. Um, if it was an ox, then supposedly what this meant was that Carthage was destined to be wealthy, but also subjugated. Um, and this is in fact what its history um, turns out to be. A horse, on the other hand, signifies that it's going to be powerful in war. Um, which was, in fact, also true until eventually they fell to the Romans. And here you have a painting, um, this is actually a Turner painting, showing the um, construction of Carthage. And notable here is the, the light source, the sun um, illuminating the, the buildings. So once Carthage is settled, um, once the buildings have risen, everybody is settled in, and the city is thriving, Yarbis, the Berber king who had originally handed over the land for the settlement, decides that he wants to marry Dido. And he, in fact, threatens to make war on Carthage if she refuses this marriage. Now, this is not because Yarbis is so in love with Dido because he thinks she's really pretty. Um, that she would make a good wife. That's not what Yarbis is thinking. He wants to marry Dido in order to effectively reclaim control of this settlement. Um, and for pretty um, understandable reasons, Dido's not interested in this marriage. Um, she wants to protect the independence of Carthage. And really this proposal of marriage is a kind of um, peace settlement that's rather unfavorable to the Carthaginians. Um, so war would be a not horrible option, although, again, it's a new settlement. They don't really want to engage in a war with these native inhabitants who are probably better armed and better able to, to fight in the particular um, geography um, of the area. So Dido, not interested in marrying Yarbis, um, decides that the way out of this is to declare her loyalty to her first husband, um, a Carabas. And this was in a kind of interesting way. It's a very traditional Roman idea um, an ideal that you that a wife will remain loyal to a single man. Um, and it's a, it's a quality that gets celebrated um, in several elite women um, that are called uniwira. Um, it means, you know, sort of you're, you're a woman with a single man. Um, so Dido comes up with a, she, she lets Yarbis think that she's going to marry him, but she comes up with an elaborate ceremony that is intended to demonstrate her loyalty to a Akerbas. Um, and so she builds this nice ceremonial funeral pyre, a kind of um, large um, pile of wood that gets lit on fire. And the point of this funeral pyre, they start off by sacrificing a number of animals. So this is meant... Um, these sacrifices are meant to signify Dido's loyalty to her husband. Um, and in part of the ceremony, Dido climbs up the pyre, so there usually stairs are constructed on the side of this, um, sort of enormous, almost a bonfire at this point. Um, and she climbs up on the side of the pyre and declares that she's now going to go to her husband. Well, everybody thinks that what she is saying is that she's going to go over to Yarbis. Well, what she's really saying is that she's going to kill herself and remain loyal to a Carabas. And standing sort of at the top of this funeral pyre, she stabs herself. Um, so she, in fact, dies by stabbing. She doesn't throw herself on the fire. Um, but it's an act of self-sacrifice. So she becomes the last of the series of sacrificial victims. Um, in order to preserve the safety of Carthage um, and its independence as a city. And she's remembered as a great hero um, for having made this sacrifice. And her death is not looked at as a suicide as much as this, this 
self-sacrifice of a woman who was chaste and courageous. The meeting of Dido and Aeneas um, that Virgil tells us about is, is really interesting um, for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, because it's, it's an invention of Virgil. Um, and what Virgil creates is a meeting between the two um, in which Aeneas, on his journey to Italy, ends up waylaid in Carthage. Um, and the story of this is told, it starts at the end of book one of the Aeneid, um, and then picks up um, the, the, the interactions of Dido and Aeneas, pick up in book four. So books two and three are devoted to Aeneas retelling the story of the Trojan War to Dido. Um, but we have in, in Virgil's Aeneid then this, this very famous telling of a meeting that probably historically never took place. Um, and that's assuming that these characters are even historical to start with. Um, and there's a lot of debate about whether Dido is really just um, a kind of goddess figure or whether there was in fact a legendary female founder who was in exile from Phoenicia. Um, and the, the, um, it's probably a little bit of both. But the important thing to, to remember is that even the mythologies of these two characters make it impossible for them to have met. They lived in different times. So Virgil's meeting of the two is anachronistic. Um, Aeneas was fighting in the Trojan War. He's a Trojan War refugee. Um, the Trojan War is dated to somewhere between 14 and 1200 BC. Dido's life dates to several centuries later. So we're talking about the foundation of Carthage in 814. So it's just impossible, you know, Vir Aeneas would have had to have been several hundred years old by the time he met Dido. Um, in Virgil, Dido's re represented as the victim of a power struggle between two goddesses, um, between Juno and Venus. And she's forced, so it's not her own will, but really sort of through divine will, she's forced to fall in love with Aeneas and betray the memory of her dead husband. And so a lot of book four is all about Dido abandoning the construction of her city and being a kind of um, in love love happy woman um, who has kind of lost her way. Aeneas eventually abandons Dido. The, his fate is to go on to Italy and so he has to leave North Africa. He doesn't particularly want to but he has to leave and out of despair Dido commits suicide. Um, so a rather different treatment of Dido's character than what we get from some of our historical sources where she is remembered as this noble and chaste founder of Carthage who makes the sacrifice to preserve the safety of her city. Um, thanks to Virgil's treatment, Dido is remembered in Virgil and in other literary sources as unchaste, um, you know, as, as very much the woman who betrays her husband. Virgil represents that betrayal. Um, and she, most of all, is remembered as the abandoned lover of Aeneas. And it's this literary portrayal that has tremendous influence on later writers, both in Latin and in vernacular languages. But there's another story to Dido, and that's sort of the interesting um, part about Virgil's invention of this meeting. Um, and in class, we'll be talking about the love story of Dido and Aeneas and analyzing some aspects of that. And here you have a, a painting representing um, the meeting of Dido and Aeneas. So Dido's sort of sitting up regally on her throne with her attendants, um, Aeneas wearing his, his Trojan helmet, um, his military garb. Um, it's apparently survived the journey quite well, um, meeting Dido in her palace. 